Okay, so this is my story. Um, growing up, I attended church on and off. My mom had grown up in the church, um, but, but she struggled to find a church in her adulthood that, that filled the same holes she had had as a child. And, um, you know, she, she had become a good personal friend with her preacher, and, and so it was hard to replace that. So my sister and I had learned about God, and, and you know, we sort of accepted as true the existence of God, the existence of Jesus, and the existence of the Holy Spirit, but we didn't really know much about them, and um, certainly weren't in any sort of relationship with them. So fast forward to when I'm about 15 years old in high school chemistry, believe it or not. So we start learning about the periodic table, right? Everybody remembers hydrogen has one electron and one proton. Helium has two electrons and two proteins. And you get up to carbon with six electrons and six protons. And, and then oxygen with eight. <clears throat> and, you know, as, as history tells us, there were holes in the discovery of some of these elements. But the scientists knew that those elements were there. They just hadn't discovered them yet. So they actually kept places for them in the periodic table for when they were discovered, they would, they would fill in those holes. Now that's not by accident, people. It's, it's just too perfect. It's, it's, it's divine, right? And so that was the first time that I actually had, I, would, I called it evidence, that God really did exist. I'd accepted it before that. I, I wasn't really a challenger of, of what I'd been told. Um, but to me, that was proof. Now, it took a long time before my relationship with God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit went beyond that. But <clears throat> at least it was a start. So I went on through the rest of high school, um, followed life rules, which was one of, one of my first idols in life. Um, following the rules, I went where I was supposed to go, did what I was supposed to do, did it when I was supposed to do it, and, and all of that. And so, you know, I, I wouldn't say my life was extraordinary, but certainly there, there wasn't anything terribly bad happening in my life. So, typical middle class American household. Um, I, I call all of this my ignorance is bliss phase. All is good, what, what is there to question? So I go to college, dated somebody my first year, dated my future husband starting my second year. We um, went through college together, and it turns out in retrospect, that had become my second idol, um, was, was that life, being that wife, being in that marriage, um, all of that. It turns out he was in the Navy, which is what brought us down here. And that means we spent a lot of time apart. Um, and I, so I was 21 when we got married, and had gone straight from you know my parents' house to college to, to marriage and had never really been on my own. Well, when you're a Navy wife, you spend a lot of time alone and you start to discover things about yourself that you never knew. You, you just learn different opinions, different thoughts, different ideas you have um, that you didn't even know was there. Well, after he got back, um, from a, a six month deployment. We, we spent another year married, but never quite got clicking again. So we ended up um, getting divorced after um, a little over three years. <clears throat> so situation of being apart had, had created a problem, but at the end of the day, I was the one who chose divorce. Uh, I left the marriage and, um, and moved on. <clears throat> so then a year later, I had a baby, idol number three. When you're a single mom, it's really, really easy. Well, when you're a married mom too, but especially when you're a single mom, it's really, really easy for your kid to be, to be the whole center of your world. And um, much to the detriment of both myself and my child, <laughs> um, it was not a healthy relationship. Um, but we did. So that was the end of 91. In 93, we started attending church regularly at simple invitation of a coworker of mine. Um, we, we had become friends, and he invited me to his church downtown. Um, and so I did, I regularly attended St. Matthew's Lutheran Church um, from 93 through 02. So nine solid years of learning the Bible, learning the rules, learning what it says. 
not learning about a relationship. Um, now, in my case, that was an important lesson. I need to know about you before I'm going to know you. And, and so that was an important nine years, but I wish I had done things a little faster. Um, <laughs> but, you know, God's timing is, is always right. So um, I just let that go along. I went to Louisiana for a few years. I actually taught the Sunday school there, all four of the children, one of which was mine. Um, <laughs> so that was, again, a, a, a good learning experience, um, but not a relationship building experience. So now we're going to fast forward to um, 2008. So we've advanced another 15 years. And I have always lived in my comfort zone. That's why I have to learn about things before I get to know things. Um, and a friend challenged me to go on a trip, which was going to be way outside of my comfort zone. She was going on a kayak trip with a bunch of women. I don't do a lot of women. I went to college with a lot of men. I deal with the low drama of men. <clears throat> but I was invited to go on a kayak trip. No, I had never kayaked with a bunch of women. Um, so divine intervention caused me to say yes, because my natural response is absolutely not. Um, <laughs> but we went up to Polly's, had a wonderful time getting to know. It was, it was a lot of young adult women, roughly, take. 20 to 25, um, and they wanted to spend some time with some more mature Christian women just talking about life. And um, turns out at four, I think I was 42 then, I needed to spend some time with some more mature Christian women too. Um, so it was a great experience. No, I did not kayak, but that's a whole separate story. Um, <laughs> but I did spend time with these women. And Three of the, the grown-ups, I'll call them, um, were given their testimonies over the course of this weekend. And so the first one was sort of the, the party girl story. Um, she was, you know, hanging out in the bars, dancing, having a good time. Um, in a marital relationship, she did not cross any lines, but um, was having a little bit too much fun. And so that, that realized on her and, you know, led to her taking a, a deeper step in her faith. And so I'm thinking, well, gosh, I did that, except I was way worse. And the emotion is starting to build. Um, and then the, the second grown-up, who was younger than me, um, had been kind of abandoned by her dad. Long involved story, but so she talked about, you know, the, the effect that had on her and her brother, um, having lost a lot of the, the normal father relationship she had. Well, gosh. <clears throat> I did that to my son, except it was way worse. I, I had actually terminated my, um, my son's father's parental rights. So he had no relationship with his father. The last time, at, at that time, the last time he saw his father was the day before he turned two months old. Um, so <clears throat> now I'm listening to her talk about how this situation brought her closer to the Lord. And I'm thinking, well, gosh, I did that to my son, except way worse. <clears throat> and then finally, later that weekend, the third person just talked about how her, her life may look really perfect right now, but she had gone through a period of kind of turmoil. It, it, it was messy. She wasn't necessarily likable then. Life was hard. And, and so that, I guess, gave me the permission to admit that I, I was broken too. You know, I, what is it to this Jesus thing? These people did these things that really didn't seem all that bad, and it brought them closer to Jesus. So what does this mean for me? Now, meanwhile, I've cried all weekend long, which I don't normally do either. <laughs> so in about 12 hours, I was transformed from a pretty good person, I thought, to, well, there's no other word for it, the label sinner applied to me. Now, most people realize that before they're 40 whatever years old, but I'd always been good. So for the first time in my life, I saw myself as a sinner. That was the work of the Holy Spirit. He convicted me through those stories to see myself as I really was and that I too needed a savior if I was gonna 
live according to God's plan for me. Um, now, since then, it's been a whirlwind. And I will say that that happened at just the right time. Because after that, things got hard. <laughs> life got hard. My handling of things got better, but life got harder. Um, so just a few anecdotes of how Jesus has shown up since then. Um, one of the first things I did, again, getting out of my comfort zone, was um, reach out for some healing prayer. I don't know if, if you know much about that. It is, it, it's, it's a process. It goes deep into all the hard things. Um, Richard is intimately involved in healing prayer ministry. And um, if you know you've got hard things you need to deal with, it, it's a great method of dealing with it. Um, so what happened, it was an interesting experience. I, I had two ladies praying with me. Now this is in April. Two ladies praying with me, one who is super, super nice, and one who has a little bit of an edge. <clears throat> of course, I want to deal with the really, really nice one because she's going to let me go easy. And so we're going through this praying and, and I don't really know what's supposed to happen. I don't know much about it. I know people recommended it, so I did it. Well, they're praying and they're asking me if I'm getting anything. And what does that mean? Are you getting anything? I, I, you're praying for me. I must be getting something, right? No, but are you getting anything? No, I'm not getting anything. So the one with the edge says, we're not leaving till you get something. So we're sitting on the couch and I'm going, oh my God, oh my God, oh my God. Give me something. I need to get something. Well, lo and behold, this image comes in full color of the Grinch. In April, the Grinch. But it's the part where his heart grows three sizes at the end of the movie. Now, I told the ladies I got that. They were satisfied. I could go home. <laughs> Me, the engineer who understands the logic to everything, has no idea what this means. So, of course, later I'm talking with friends, and they knew exactly what this meant. Um, I had... I have a very high capacity for empathy. And um, just going through life, I had shut it down. I, did, I didn't have a constructive way of managing my emotional response to things. Um, so I just stopped. I stopped feeling those kinds of things and I stopped responding to them. Um, and, and healing prayer grew, grew my heart again. Um, and of course that started with the testimonies when I could not control my crying um, but it's been it's been a wonderful and terrifying thing to feel again um, but <clears throat> it's healthy so COVID made it really easy to, to lock myself in my house and, and sort of scale that back but I'm, I'm coming back into the world um, and around the same time, my son started having some issues. He was in high school and um, not hanging with the best crowd. Um, and, you know, of course, I'm thinking about the fact that he had no father influence, direct father influence in his life and, and um, struggling with how to handle that. So a lot of my prayers involved that situation. Um, and one particular time I'm in... Um, Coastal Covered over in Bell Hall, my favorite store in the whole world. I don't cook. I love that store. Um, <laughs> but so I'm, I'm in there and I'm thinking about Josh and I'm praying and, and I started thinking about um, where, um, you know, Jesus talks about the, the shepherd goes after the one sheep that wanders off. And as I'm walking through the store, I look up and there it, they had their Christmas display up and there was um, the shepherd smoker holding a sheet. And it was just the stupid things like that that happen all the time now that, that are answers to prayers. You know, it, it's, it's Jesus intervening on my behalf, telling me that he's there, he hears me, he sees me, and he's, 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 he's holding that lost sheep. He's got it. Um, so that, that was kind of a fun one. Um, 
Another one that I have told often to, pro to, to parents who are having some issues with their kids um, was really kind of cool. I was just laying in bed one night and, and, you know, thinking about how God has the whole world in his hand. There's even a song about it. Um, and I started going, yeah, but, but you know, a, a hand is only so big. My, I know my son, and he's, he's dancing right on that edge. And when you're on the edge, you can fall off. And the next thing I know, this image, plain as day, comes into my head. And it's, it's like the, the, the lens just zoomed out. And Josh was this little speck in God's hand. And, and that hand was just massive compared to that child. And, um, and it was just, it was a really sweet moment and a tender moment. And, and it helped me sleep that night. Um, and it has helped me sleep a lot of nights since then. Um, and, and, and that, I know that story itself has been a blessing to some other parents. So that's another way that God showed right up. Um, and the last one I'm going to share has been probably the most personal and intimate, um, back and forth I've had. It, it occurred over the course of a weekend. I was in Florida actually at a, um, at a church retreat, um, couldn't begin to tell you what the retreat was about. The whole time for me was just this wrestling, if you will, with, with God. Um, but what happened, you know, he, he was asking me questions and asking me to think into those issues that had, you know, resulted in, in my marriage, the situation with my son, all of that. And, and I had, it turned out, I didn't know it at the time, but I, I had put a label on myself. Um, you know, I had repented of my sins. I had turned away from them. I, I had done all the things, but I hadn't let go of that label that I had put on myself. Um, and so as we're going back and forth over the course of this weekend, um, Jesus challenged me to remove that label. Um, and it was right on my forehead. And so I'm, I'm, I'm sitting there, talks are going on, no idea what, what they're talking about. And I'm wrestling to remove this tack and it would not come out. I, I, I could not remove that label from myself. And later on at lunch, Jesus shows up and he took that label off of me as only he can do. I didn't know that was where we were going, but as soon as it happened, I was like, duh, I know about this stuff, but I had to learn it at a personal level. And so Jesus removes this label, and then, get this, he coats me in Teflon. What the heck? What is that about? I don't know what that's about. And several days later, as I'm praying into this, it occurs to me, he knew I was going to put that label back on. <laughs> Jesus took that label off, and little miss know-it-all was going to put that dang label back on, and he wasn't going to let that happen. And it, it was, well, I, I mean, obviously, I still get emotional about it, because it was, it was so personal. He knew me better than I knew me and he still knows me better than I know me um so all of those to say one get out of your comfort zone somebody says let's go do this let's go hear this let's go see this if your first inclination is to say no think again second thing <clears throat> is uh, it was new to me, but y'all have probably heard the expression, be a sheep from the front and a shepherd from the back. Um, so those who are, you know, behind you in their faith, I, I don't like that phrase, but those who are behind you in, in your faith are looking to you to be guided and, you know, to be trained, to be informed, to be taught, to be protected. And the, those in front of you see you as a sheep. They know you're following them. You want to learn from them. You want to 
be protected by them and be guided by them. Um, well, my corollary to that is to hear stories and to tell stories. For, for those shepherds in front of you, be the sheep, hear what they have to say. <clears throat> um, and, and hopefully this summer that's going to happen. You're going to have a formal process to hear people's stories. But informally, ask, ask them things. Uh, whatever questions you have, either they've had that question and they'll have an answer, or they haven't had that question and you're going to advance them in their faith. So either way, ask them questions. Make them tell you their stories. And to those coming up behind you, share your stories. Tell them it. You know, when, when you have a story that fits a particular situation, tell that story. When you have an opportunity to tell your whole story, tell it. Because there is so much to be learned. And the last thing I want to say is don't, just don't be content where you are. Wherever you are, you can bring people closer to where you are. And wherever you are, you can keep moving. So keep moving.